Welcome to the supernatural shore, to the liminal place where land meets sea, and to the magical world of the mythical mermaid. Ever since man gazed out over the open oceans, he's been in awe of its incredible beauty and destructive power in equal measures. He has populated its depths with all manner of creatures, monsters and sea deities. Some of these stories have survived the test of time and none more so than that of the half-fish, half-human mermaid, siren of the seas, the incredible beauty who sits upon the rocks and combs her long golden hair, whose voice can create storms and drive seafarers mad. Her image has been immortalised in art, poetry, song and story the world hour. Scotland is a land rich in mermaid lore. In the Orkney Isles they believed that mermaids were the daughters of the finfolk, a race of dark amphibious sorcerers. And these mermaids, why they hungered for the love of mortal man, for if they married and they could forever keep their, their youth and beauty. And this pagan sea goddess, why she was later vilified as a demon by Christianity, said to be repelled by words for the Bible, holy water and the sign of the cross. A mortal marriage and a mermaid marriage, why that was frowned upon. For they believed that these creatures had no soul. And one such story, a man, he tried to save the soul, his recently deceased mermaid wife, by burying her in the local kirkyard. But the merfolk, they came to the shore, and their wailing produced a great tidal wave that washed over the church, opened up the graves, where they were waiting to receive the body of the mermaid at sea. But these were not just stories. For folk, for the coasts and the islands of Scotland, they believed in their existence, that they were as real as you or I. In 1833, six fishermen for Yale and Shetland, why they caught a creature in their nets. It was three feet long, and according to them, it had the tail of a fish, the upper body a woman, except its arms were small, and its face, why it looked a bit like a monkey. They kept it on board for three years, all the time it wailed and cried pitifully and fearing that it might bring them bad luck, they released it back to the ocean and never seen it again. Perhaps it swam down to the Western Isles for a few years later, a similar creature, it washed up on the shores of Bembecula as a testament to how human it looked, the locals, they placed it inside a child's coffin and buried it on the shore where it was found. The last documented sighting of a mermaid in Scotland was in 1947 by a fisherman for the Isle of Muck. He said that he saw one sitting on an upturned heron box, combing her, her long hair but as soon as she saw that she was being watched, why she dived beneath the waves. Most of these creatures hey, creation stories. So I'd like to share my version, a yin that originally came for the Isle of Skye. In the time before remembering, there were folk who could walk upon the land, and there were folk who could walk under the sea. Now the women that came for the sea were called mermaids and they were beautiful with pale shimmering skins and lang hair that was adorned by all manner of seashells and pearls. 
It was said that one look for them could forever steal the hurt of any landman who dared to look their way. And it was well kent that the most beautiful mermaids in Oyalpa came for the kingdom of Fife, for their skin not only shimmered, it glistened like gold in the sunlight. As you might imagine, this made the earthy woman of the land hateful, for they had lost many a, a husband and son to the sea sirens for under the firth of force. So they called upon the great god of the sea and offered him treasure in exchange for his help with a husband and son stealing that was blight in the land and was especially bad around the Weems Bay area. It just so happened he was a greedy god, so he took the treasure and he forbade the mermaids for seducing the menfolk for fife. But they were vain creatures and nay content with sitting on rocks and combing their hair. They were soon back to their wicked ways, soon back to seducing the menfolk of the kingdom. So once more, the women of the land, they went to the god of the sea and they beseeched him for his help. Upon hearing all oh, their continuing troubles, his anger created a storm that raged for three days and nights. And to punish the mermaids, why he took away their long, shapely legs. And in return, he gave them a green, scaly tail. Well, the mermaids, they cried and wailed. Why, the mermaids, they became so bitter and twisted inside that they swore that no man who took to the sea would be safe for their spell. For that day on, they would swim around Inchkeith Island to tempt the holy men who lived there. And they would sit out on rocks on the firth the forth to call to ships, but no to steal the hearts of men, but to steal their very souls, for they would have their vengeance for losing their land legs. And that is what happened in the time afore remembering. So I'd like to share with you another story, my favourite mermaid tale that originally comes for the Orkney Isles and it's called Johnny Croy and his mermaid wife. Johnny Croy, he was a, the bravest, the boldest and the bonniest man in all a Orkney. One day while he was out walking along the shore, he heard the an enchanted singing coming from behind a big rock. Curious, he peered behind to hey a better look. And there, sitting, combing her long hair, was a mermaid with a shimmering petticoat tied around her waist that looked a bit like a fishtail. And the mare that she combed and sung combed and sung, the mare Johnny fell ever so deeply in love with her. He couldn't resist it. He crept up behind her and stole a kiss for her lips. The mermaid, she jumped up and whacked him so hard that he fell flat on his back upon the sands. She gathered up her shimmering petticoat, run into the sea and only turned round to hear a look to see who dared to steal a kiss for her lips. It was then that she noticed how handsome Johnny was and knew that if she could be his wife, she could forever keep her youth and beauty. And as Johnny, he got to his feet, he spied her silver comb in the sands, picked it up. The mermaid cried out, My comb, my comb, my precious comb, give me back my silver comb. He just laughed and said she could have the comb. 
but only if she agreed to be his wife and live with him upon the land. For he could never love another after seeing such incredible beauty. I cannot come and live upon your land, said the mermaid. I do not like your yellow sun, your black rain, or your white snow. You come, come handsome man, and live with me under the waves where the wind does not blow. Well, they both tried to tempt each other, all the while falling deeper in love until the mermaid saw some people coming to the shore and quickly swam off, mourning the loss of the handsome man and her silver comb. Johnny went to him. We are sair hurt and a silver comb in his pocket. He told his mother, the local spaywife, what had happened. Well, she chastised him. Never fall in love with such a creature. They are unholy things. Nay union should be allowed. It's against God. You must throw that comb back into the sea, or you will forever be under her spell. He had no intention again the comb back. After that day, why, he thought a little else. And he awoke one morning, and there at the foot of his bed stood the mermaid. He thought he was dreaming. He rubbed his eyes. But the vision was there in front of him. And then she spoke. I have come for my comb, and to ask you once more, to come and live with me under the sea in my crystal palace. Johnny refused, saying if she didn't come and live with him, his heart would surely break and he would die. Well, the mermaid, she agreed, but on condition, that they would live upon the land for seven years. And after that time, he would come and live with her and her folk under the sea. They were married shortly after. During the ceremony, this unholy creature, she shivered and shook. She stuffed her hair into her ears so she couldn't hear the priest speaking. But the people of Orkney, they soon forgave her, for she made Johnny a loving wife. And in seven years, they had seven bonny barons. At the end of the final year, they prepared for a, a long sea voyage. Johnny went to bid his mother farewell. But Johnny's mother had never warmed to the mermaid and was angry that she was going to lose her only son to that unholy creature. So they bid each other a tearful farewell and he left her to mind the youngest child. Her heart was full of hate when she formed a cross o wire, heated it in the glowing embers of the fire until it turned red. And then she burnt it into the baby's back, muttering under her breath, a son for a son, a son for a son. When the boat was ready, the mermaid, she come to collect her baby. She tried to lift the cradle, but it wouldn't budge. So she flung back the covers to lift out the baron. But when she touched him, her flesh burst to flames and she ran out screeching down to the shore, shouting for her husband to push the boat out. The whole of the island heard her lamenting 
wil ons oorbeel. Alas, alas, I've left my bonny bairn to live and die upon dry land. Alas, alas, I've left my bonny bairn to live and die upon dry land. Well, a strange wind appeared as if anywhere. The boat disappeared. Johnny Croy, his mermaid wife, and their six parents were never seen again. His mother brought up the baby and called him Corsa Croy, which means Croy of the Cross. In time, he grew up to be just like his father, the bravest, the boldest, and the bonniest man in all eight Orkney. He went on to have many great adventures o his own, until he died at the age of 200. For it is said that the descendants of the sea folk are blessed with long and happy lives. And that is the story of Johnny Croy and his mermaid wife. So whether you believe in mermaids or no, the fact remains that they will swim through the seas and the imaginations of mankind until the end of time. <laughs>